Welcome back. Hoping to inspire you to read your Bible every single day, zero excuse. And well, I hope it's working. Acts chapter one all week. Oh man, it's been good. The power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And today it's pretty simple. Verse nine, all the way through, well, verse 14. Pretty simple. Five verses, but man, it's going to sting a bit. I'm going to let you go get some Band-Aids and just, well, I'll wait on you. Okay, welcome back. Here we go. New Living Translation, verse 9. After saying this, Jesus was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of about a half a mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of the ones present, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. Man, here's my thought. What happens when the very Jesus you've been walking with for three years you hung your hat on him. You've staked all your claim on him. You've been following him, hoping for the best the whole time. Like, man, I'm going to get me a gold watch out of this one. <laughs> I'm probably going to get some good retirement hanging out with Jesus. He's going to bring a kingdom. I'm going to get to sit on his right hand, <laughs> not his left, his right. Ooh, that's me, the right hand guy. <laughs> well, that's what they're thinking the whole time. They're even walking with him, arguing over well, who's going to get to be at your right hand? Who's going to be the best? Who's going to be your favorite? Who's going to be the one you like the most? I think it was John. He was the one that reclined his head on Jesus's bosom. I don't even know if I like the word bosom, but it sure does sound romantic. John liked himself a whole lot, but probably was considered one of Jesus's favorites. But can you imagine sitting on a hillside thinking, this is the moment, boys. We're about to take over the world. We're going to conquer Rome. We're going to chop the ears off of Caesar. <laughs> uh, Peter had already had some practice, by the way. Well, and it doesn't go anything like you planned. Whew. Jesus. When he crushes all of our hopes and dreams just because he is who he is. Everything I wanted him to do. Everything I prayed for him to do everything I wished he would do. And then all of a sudden, when I've hung all my hat on him, I got all my kids excited about it. My wife's finally on board that I left my fishing business to follow him. Standing on a hillside, he disappears. You gotta love that. Best failed business plan ever. <laughs> left everything I had for him and he let me down. He didn't answer my prayers. He didn't bring his kingdom and he left me standing on a blooming hillside watching him go up into heaven like he's Iron Man. <laughs> well, most of us today would have walked off disappointed, bitter at God, mad that he didn't do life the way I wish he would have done it. Ticked off at him. He didn't answer my prayer. He didn't fix my marriage. He didn't help my business. He left me high and dry sitting on a hillside, staring up in heaven. I think that's a lot of Christians today. They started out very passionate. They started out, I'm giving you everything, God. I might even tithe. You might get 10% if you're lucky. And then they come to church and then they read their Bible and they get excited because God's on their side. And then suddenly in a moment of time, standing on a hillside, something happened, snap of a finger, and God didn't perform the way they wish they would have performed. 
And well, now they're ticked off, mad, upset, bitter, dropped out of church, and well, blaming God, become agnostic, maybe even atheist, because God probably doesn't exist because he didn't do life my way. And the only reason I know God could exist is he would have to do life my way because it proves he must be real when he answers everything I need him to answer. So therefore, his reality is based upon, well, everything I need out of him. And then, well, when I don't get it, and he leaves me standing on a hillside, well, I mean, if he's not going to do what I want him to do, I'm just going to keep doing what I wish I could have done all along anyway. And yet the apostles lend us this idea. They didn't leave ticked off or upset. They did what most people that are religious do. We just stand around staring up in heaven, hoping something religious is going to happen. Hoping our fantasies will get answered by God. Hoping he'll make all my dreams come true. It's such a powerful thing that even an angel had to show up, a couple of them, and say, hey, fellas, what are you doing standing around? Why don't you go get busy? And you know they did. They left that hillside probably a little bit emotionally disappointed. I like the way it said it, and Jesus was taken up from them. He disappeared from their sight while they're watching him. How do you do when Jesus disappears from everything you wish he would have done for you? How do you fare? Are you just religious, staring up in heaven, singing the songs, going through the motions, doing what you always do, but there's really no life? There's really no joy? If you are honest, God has been nothing but a disappointment to you because he didn't do it the way you wish he would have done it. Well, had those guys and girls started out that way in Acts chapter one, we wouldn't be here today because probably on the hills of disappointment, they did what every one of us need to do. We need to go back and get busy with God and start with prayer. I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you feel like God's disappointed you didn't answer your prayers, did not become your magic lamp and your four-leaf clover and your lucky rabbit's foot. But do you love him enough that even though he, quote, didn't do what you wished he would have done, do you love him enough to come back into your prayer closet and go, God, if you can use anything, you can use me. And if anybody comes across my path today that needs you, may I ever be so bold to lead them to you. Or... Is the life of Jesus going to stop with you? The people in your 50 feet will never know Jesus because you're still disappointed on the hillside. The people you work with will never know his joy because you didn't get a prayer answered. It's up to you today. I told you it would sting a bit, but I'm telling you this. If you will go back into the game, if you will dust yourself off, if you will let go of all of your, well, missed hopes, opportunities, and dreams, and you will just say again, Lord, if you can use anything, use me. I know this about God. You'll get to the end of your life and you will have no disappointments for trusting him. Not one regret if you'll stay in the game with God. The beautiful thing I like about all these people we read about, they seemingly didn't have one regret for ever serving God. And that's my challenge for you today. Hey, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. It's going to be a blast.